we were playing some uh, some clips that Rhino hand picked. Uh, a tribute to JT, but mostly just in, in enjoying him, doing what he loved to do. Here's one JT's all time favorite interview, right, Rhino? And this is with Paul Abraham, the manager of Leonard Skinner. Here we go. All righty, there you go. The JT Show, Super Tard, Mississippi. Glad you're here today. And uh, you can uh, say hello with us. Paul Abraham is here with us, and um, he is uh, going to visit with us here in just uh, for just a few minutes. As uh, he has uh, been working uh, road manager for rock legends such as Leonard Skinner, the Marshall Tucker Band, uh, the Fabulous Thunderbirds, Bad Company, and more. And uh, we've got him here with us. And uh, as a matter of fact, uh, Paul, I believe you're here from Mississippi, aren't you, sir? I am. I was born and raised in Leland, Mississippi, in the middle of the Delta. How in the world did you ever make it over into rock and roll and all that all that craziness? Man, it is a long, sordid tale. <laughs> my, my father was a um, a radio man. He had a he owned a radio station in Leland that was called WESY. That was a soul station. Right. And um, you know, I got to I, I got real well versed with the blues, and uh, I met a lot of the artists uh, like Bobby Rush and Little Milton and all those guys way back then, and and just was. Um, just love music and um uh, my brother and i started uh promoting concerts in 1974 and leonard skinner happened to be the first one that we promoted well uh talk a little bit about that now obviously i know you weren't with them uh obviously when the plane went down i actually uh interviewed roy eckerman who i, I believe that was his name uh, ron, yeah. ron, ron, ron eckerman i'm sorry yeah uh, i interviewed ron oh goodness paul it was probably about six years ago yeah, and yeah, he uh, wrote a book, yeah. and uh, he has since passed away. Has he really? Well, yeah. I can tell you this: he um, he could detail that he detailed that like there were nothing, uh, like there was no comparison. I mean, it was like it was yesterday. The way he described it, and and and, and Ron was actually uh, on the plane with them. Uh, we played yes, he was. that. We 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 yes, he was. we he sure was. We actually archived that, put it up on the blog, and, and, and put that out there. And it was just a, it's a fascinating story that he told that night, and I did not realize that he had passed. Uh, but that, yes. book, that book is very interesting. It's a very interesting book that people need to read. So tell me about Skinner. How did you get hooked up with those guys? Well, uh, like I said, my brother and I, um, decided, I, I, I first saw them when I lived in Atlanta. And I tell you what, uh, they just flat blew me away. I could not believe that Ronnie Van Zandt was standing on stage barefooted, singing all these songs about growing up in the South and, and you know, all these stories that he was telling in his songs. And they all, it seemed like every one of them related to me. Right. And uh, we just, uh, Ronnie and I hit it off, and we had a, we had some great conversations. And uh, my brother and I decided to bring him to Cleveland, Mississippi, to put him on in concert. And uh, we did. And from that day on, we just were real good friends with the guys in the band and um, yep. uh, stayed in constant contact with them. What year did you bring them to Cleveland? Uh, 1974. Wow. Yep. What, did they play there at Delta State? No, uh, actually, it was a. Uh, it's an old. Um, it's an old kind of an, a rodeo building. Um, it's called the Bolivar County Expo Building, and mm -hmm. I mean, it was, had a dirt floor and running. All the guys in the band just loved it because it it just felt like them. You know? <laughs> and uh, uh, we we probably put about four or five thousand people in that place, and. And to tell you the truth, nobody had really heard of Skinner at the time. It was uh, it was one of those deals that we said, shoot, we'll give it a go. Uh, we got them pretty cheap. Uh, they were already they had already toured with the Who, but uh, we we got them pretty dang cheap. And and even on the day of the show, Ronnie Van Zant uh, gave us a five hundred dollar discount and told us that he wanted to stay an extra day just to hang out with us, and which we. We went to Greenville, you know, hung out at, the, at the one block east, drank a bunch of skip and go nakeds, and just had a big old time. And got to be real good friends with the guys. And, and like I said, we remained that way all through the years. And and and, and to be fair, in '74 they were they were they were not at the height of their popularity. They were on their way, uh, and they were very popular, but they were not at the height. Uh, of their popularity the the height of their popularity actually they were they were at the pinnacle right there about the crash time was weren't they yeah, absolutely i mean they really and truly were they were they were hitting their pace right about that time and and uh, it was just the most horrible thing that could have ever happened to to anybody a fan a family member or 
or anybody else, to tell you the truth. It was um, it was a sad day. It really was. Paul, there's a lot of people, I and mean, you go back and you hear the story, and, I, and Ron even talked about this just a little bit uh, when he when he was there. But there was a, they all had a feeling before they got on that plane. Um, they 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 had a real bad feeling, and they had reason to have bad feelings. The plane, had, oh sure, the plane had been giving them problems, and uh, basically. Ronnie told them to all get their ass on the plane, that if it was their time to go, it was their time to go. And pretty much everybody did, didn't they? Yeah. Ronnie Ronnie had, he had I guess he had always had a vision that he wouldn't live to see 30, and um, and he didn't. The plane itself was, Harold Smith had looked at, at uh, chartering that plane, and they turned it down because of all the problems it was having. They Literally, the guys the, the day before saw fire, uh, blowing out the, the back of the, one of the engines, mm-hmm. you know, and it's like, why in the world they got on that plane? I don't know. But Ron, Ronnie may have said that. He may not have said that. I don't know. Well, I and, and that's because the, I wasn't there. Well, obviously they weren't, but that was that was the scuttlebutt about it, is everybody had yeah. a bad feeling about it. And and basically, according to the story, Ronnie, and, and according to Ron, Ronnie basically said, look, we got to fly this thing one more time. Let's get to Baton Rouge, get the concert over. If it's our time to go, it's our time to go. We're gonna fly this thing one more time and then we're gonna do something different. That was yeah, that they, you know what they had a they had a uh, mechanic that was flying into Baton Rouge. Right. To work on the plane. That's so right. there you go. <laughs> the plane actually and, and what we've learned is uh, from now is the plane the reason why it was flaming, it was it was stuck in auto rich. That one right. particular engine, it was stuck in auto rich, or, or either the the pilots had put it in auto rich and didn't pay attention to it. It was putting way too much fuel in the plane, and that's where the flames were coming from. Was all the extra fuel that was not being burnt in the combustion chamber, but literally being burnt as it was coming out of the exhaust. And that's absolutely right. right. And that's that's where they feel like that uh, the reason why the plane ran out of gas, and then. I also, Ron also told a story of they sat there waiting on one particular band member to get there. I don't remember who it was. Uh, one particular member of the band to get there, and they waited with the engines running and waited for about an hour uh, for yeah. one, one person to get there, and I forgot who he said it was. I would, I would say it was Leon. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> I, I, uh, I got a little section in the book called Looking for Leon, and I spent a lot of time looking for Leon. So, so I'm going to guess that's who it was. So uh, a little more about Skinner. Obviously, you worked with them. Uh, you you worked with them uh, once they got together, got the tribute tour going, and you actually uh, worked for them, right? I did. I sure did. Uh, it was. Um, I was living in Colorado, and uh, my wife and I, and Gary Rossington was living in Jackson Hole, Wyoming. And uh, I would go up to visit. We, my wife and I would go up to visit him and his wife Dale, and uh, we we really got close. And when they started talking about this tribute to him, Gary was Gary was like he was he was kind of dead set against it starting out because he did he just really didn't know if if it would be done right. And you know basically he just he was concerned that that basically that Ronnie wasn't there, that Steve wasn't there, and and you know it was a it was a deal where they would have to come out and, and he wasn't going to do it unless the band could be absolutely perfect and sound just like the records. So. Um, Gary and I were up there, and he was telling me that these folks were wanting to put this thing together. And, and I said, well, man, I think, it's, I think it would do great. And obviously it did. And he said, well, I tell you what, Paul, and, and he just came off the top of his head. He was like this. He said, I tell you what, if you'll come out with me and do this tour, he said, I'll do it. And I'm like, well, Gary, absolutely, I'll do it. I said, I've never done anything like this before. He said, oh, we're only going to do 32 shows. And I said, okay, fine. So I went out with him at security. And... Um, Oh, probably uh, halfway through that first or the second leg of the of the tour, they decided they wanted to make me tour manager because I was a little bit more than security. I had a I had a way of, of I was I was very organizational. I could I could do the job, <laughs> and um, it was just uh, you know we went out and did 32 shows, and then we did probably 132 more and then we probably did 232 more <laughs> so 10 years later we were still out there doing it and and to tell you the truth i i really when i finally left the band i it, it i had really gotten kind of burnt out on on being out there it, it's a hard job i mean working for those guys was extremely difficult 
I want to talk a little bit about Artemis Pyle and, and how that relationship uh, just kind of deteriorated after 1991. I know I don't know if you were still with that, and then obviously take it into today with the, the court fight over the biopic and everything else. If you can talk about that, we'll continue with you. Paul Abraham hanging out here with us with us on the dinner. Hanging out with Paul Abraham, who has uh, been uh, – uh, in the music industry for a long time, we're talking about Leonard Skinner a little bit and some more, and uh, we appreciate you taking some time, Paul, to visit with us here today. And Absolutely. Uh, talk about everything that's going down. And so uh, B- Artemis Pyle, he, he just kind of disappeared from uh, the Leonard Skinner tribute tour. What was it, about 91, wasn't it? Man, I tell you what, it was, it was the most fateful day you have ever seen. We were in Toronto, Canada, and... Uh, <clears throat> Artemis had been drinking a little champagne, which he he never drinks, and he was just in a hell of a way all day long. And about the middle of the set, we had two drummers at the time, uh, two actual sets of drummers on the stage, and Kurt Custer was the other drummer. Right. Uh, because Artemis, his, his stamina was a little bit uh, lacking because of all the problems he had had uh, down through the years. But anyway... Artemis starts trashing his drum kit on stage. I mean, he he, he picked his snare, threw it up over his, over his head back, and it landed on the stage. He was hitting his uh, ride cymbal with a um, with a tambourine, and it broke, and a piece of it almost hit Dale Rossington, who was uh, one of the, the Hawkettes, the backup singers. Right. And 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 I'm watching all this, and Gary <laughs> turns around, and sees me standing over in the wings, and he just gives me that that head movement, like, get him off of here. I go out, grab Artemis behind, from behind, drag him off the stage, um, pull him out to the back of the venue, and we're just, I sat there and tried to calm him down. Um, he was back there. He was crying over this and that. I mean, he just, he had had a bad day, and, and some of those, he had had, you know, maybe some rows with a couple of the other band members. Well, that was Artemis's last day in the band, and to tell you the truth, I, I totally disagree with why they why they let him go. I mean, my goodness, you're working for the band called Leonard Skinner, and if if there had ever been any adversity at all with any band, this was the band that lived. So, I mean, sure, Artemis had a bad day, but why fire him? Um, right. But now they're now they're trying to. Artemis was wanting to put a movie out, and uh, they they blocked that. But a judge actually put an injunction out because it didn't. It 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 wasn't. Um, I don't even know the word, but it didn't go along with the settlement that they had, that they had done some years ago. So anyway, um, Artemis is out. He's still out doing playing music as the Artemis Pile Band. And and to be honest with you, I love Artemis to death. He's a great guy. Um, as long as he's not drinking. Right. So There's a lot he, of people he, that are like that. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, and I know a lot of them. <clears throat> and most of them that were in that band, as a matter of fact, man, I tell you, they, they could go through some Jack Daniels. Man, well, that was that was what I wanted to talk about. I know we're going kind of back and forth, but... It's okay. Let's talk about Ronnie Van Zant, the person, just a little bit. His music was very political. Uh, some people even attribute that he might be kind of to the left if he were here uh, alive today. What do you think? I know, I know that Ronnie. I mean, Gun Control. He he sang that song, you know, Saturday, Saturday Night, Night Special, Special, right? And uh, he, I, I think that Ronnie, it, Ronnie was a visionary. For goodness' sake, I, I can't say that he was left, right, or middle, or whatever. But uh, he was a visionary, and he wrote what he felt, and right. he wrote. A, he wrote stories, you know. He he told real, true to life stories, and uh, you know he was just just an exceptional songwriter, probably one of the best ever. And he he was a great guy. Ronnie and I spent many hours just sitting and talking. I hope you can't hear that damn bird in the background. It's all right. Don't worry about it. Nobody <laughs> else can. <laughs> okay, he's raising hell in there, but. Um, Ronnie was a was a true friend, and um, the day that he he passed away, it really just tore me up, and uh, as it did a lot of other people. Well, he... and obviously this past weekend was the 40th anniversary sure. of the plane crash, and there was a lot going on. From what I understand, there was a lot of people down in Gillsburg, and there was a lot of people in Jacksonville that all got together, and um, it was um, it's pretty touching the way people still remember. 
I know when Ron Ron said he remembered as they were getting him out of there and uh, Ronnie at the time of the, the and and a lot of the reason why he was in the front of the plane he was having a lot of back problems uh, he was he, he was hurting having a lot of back problems he was tired they were worn out they've been on the road and uh, actually had I guess one of the honkettes or somebody was back there trying to help him uh, was kind of trying to help him pop his back he was laying on the on the floor of the plane toward the front while everybody else was mostly in the back playing cards and they they feel like that really had something to do with the reason why he perished. Uh, but I know Ron said as they were getting him out of the wreckage and he went by and he saw Ronnie, obviously he was dead. Uh, or yeah. Ron didn't know that. But Ron said, well, it looks like Ronnie's finally getting some rest. That was what he said. Oh, God. And th- those guys were tired. Uh, there was no doubt about it. Yeah. But as you talk about being a visionary, the song That Smell, Ronnie wrote that because was it Artemis or was it Gary Rossi? One of them had just wrapped a brand new Grand Torino around a tree. That uh, was Gary Rossi. Yeah, he gotten gotten drunk and high and everything, and a brand new Grand yeah. Torino went out and crashed the car. This was right before the crash. This was right before the plane crash, because that smell was actually on Street Survivors. That's and, that's correct. And Ronnie wrote that's that correct. song uh, for Gary Rossington. He did. That's right. absolutely the truth. And, uh, I mean, that's the way Ronnie was. Uh, a, a quick for instance, um, Ronnie wrote, wrote about band members. Uh, the song, uh, um, What's Your Name? Yeah. The first line of the song, back at the hotel, Lord, we got such a mess. One mm-hmm. of the crew had to go with one of the guests. And Ronnie wrote that about Craig Reed, who was... Oh man, Craig! Craig is just we 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 had a funny thing. Craig was a, a survivor of the plane crash, and he came out on the road and, and he didn't do a whole hell of a lot. He was he was a great guy and we, everybody loved him. But um, on on our itinerary that we printed up every every you know for every tour, we put down there. Um, okay, Paul Abraham, tour manager, so and so this. Craig Reed, manager in charge of Diddley Squat. <laughs> so, <laughs> he was he was a hell of a guy though, but he's the one that that song was written about, and he's he's still around. He's not touring anymore, but he's still around, and I stay in, in constant contact with him. These guys were these guys were notorious for uh, they they'd trash a hotel room in a minute, wouldn't they? Oh my God! Uh, the night that Artemis uh, left the band. We were again. We were in Toronto. We went back to the Four Seasons Hotel after the show. Um, Gary and Johnny trashed one of the suites, which there's no telling what that cost. Artemis trashed his room. Um, when we left the hotel that night, we were asked politely, or rather, not so politely, to not ever come back to a uh, Four Seasons property anywhere in the world. <laughs> so we had, I mean, the, the, a couple of weeks later, we were booked into the Four Seasons uh, uh, right off of uh, Central Park in New York. So we had to find a new hotel. So, but yeah, that's they were they were notorious about that. And Leon, every time October twentieth would roll around, um, he would trash his room every time. Just couldn't handle it. Yeah, huh? it, yeah I told, I asked him. I said, Leon, what 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 got into you, buddy? And he says. He said, Ronnie, Steve, Cassie, Dean. And that's, he said, that's what got into me, son. So was it true, and I know you weren't around those guys then, but you knew them. Was it true the reason why they had to have that plane is they'd pretty much been banned from commercial flights as well because of an uh, incident with a roadie that they actually tried to toss off a plane? Is that true or was that rumor? That is that is true. And uh, even, even after we started the tribute tour, we <laughs> – I'm in I'm in Nashville waiting on the guys to get there because they were supposed to catch a flight from uh, from Huntsville, Alabama. And Gary Rossington, I don't know what got into him that day, but um, he said something to somebody and they kicked the whole lot of them off the plane and had to had to catch a they had to rent a van to drive to Nashville from Huntsville. So it, it, you know they they were. They were rednecks, man. Rednecks with cash, and that's a very dangerous combination, <laughs> if you know what I mean. <laughs> rednecks with money—that's a bad deal, huh? 
Yes, sir, it is. I guarantee you. <laughs> of course, I wouldn't know anything about that. <laughs> You're just a redneck. You don't have that, a lot of money. Hey, That's I, right. I, I, want, I, want, I want to continue with you if you can, if you got time. Uh, just I one, got all the time in the world. I just want one more segment because I want to talk about Leonard Skinner today. Obviously, Ricky Medlock there with him from, from Blackfoot. But I'll tell you this. They're about as tight a band as I've heard, and if you close your eyes, you literally can believe that you're listening to Leonard Skinner. I love the way they're going back and playing the old music and doing the things they that made them Leonard Skinner. I want to talk to you about that, too, coming up next. As we'll continue here with Paul Abraham, former manager of Leonard Skinner, and hanging out with you today here on the JT Show. Uh, we've got more. 